I pray that the Holy Spirit will help both me, the speaker, and everyone hearing me today. I pray that the wisdom gleaned from the word of God will be highly beneficial in lifting us, each one of us, from where we are to where we ought to be financially. I pray that it will not just be words only that shall come forth today, but it shall be words laden with Holy Ghost power. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Let the Spirit of Christ enable the word to give life to every hearer today in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you will produce testimonies in the lives of everyone who applies the nuggets and the principles laid on the table. In the end, nobody shall be left out. For God is no respecter of persons. We pray that nobody will escape the influence and the impact of your word and your grace to lift us from Begali Valley to Beverly Hills. Thank you, precious Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today is June 23, 2021, and we are going to part four in our series for Wisdom for Living. Our theme is financial intelligence for the whole month of June 2021. And we have one more part next week, which is the last Wednesday of June. That will be June 30. That will be part five. So today is part four. Now, before we touch on today's focus, I want to bring us to par, particularly for the benefit of those who may not have joined us in parts one to three. By the way, if you missed parts one to three, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, Official TSF Church. That is our YouTube channel. You will find parts one, two, and three already uploaded there to our YouTube channel. And today we are having part four, but in part three, these were the high points that we had in part three from last week. First, we looked at the four components of financial intelligence. Don't forget that in part one, we looked at the seven components of wealth. If we say a person is wealthy, what precisely does that person possess that qualifies him as a wealthy person or qualifies her as a wealthy person? Wealth is not just about money. But money is one of the seven components of true wealth. We established that very clearly in part one, but we are focusing on the high points of part three. And in part three, we looked at the four components of financial intelligence. In other words, if a person is financially intelligent, we expect that person to understand money, to understand the game of money, to understand the rules of money to understand the character of money, the nature of money. Those are the things that we examined in part three. And number two, a financially intelligent person also knows how to make money, how to generate income, how to generate revenue. If a person doesn't know how to make money, that person is not financially intelligent. That is a financial illiterate. Number three, a financially intelligent person knows how to manage the money that he has already made. And managing that money will be looked into very critically subsequently. And number four, a financially intelligent person knows how to multiply the money that he or she already have. So we have looked at understanding money in greater detail last week. And today we're going to be focusing on how to make money understanding how to make money. Now, I'm not going to be teaching on uh, real estate or different uh, uh, trades and things that people do to, to make money, but we're going to be laying out principles governing how to make money. And when you operate by those principles, those principles are sacrosanct, those principles are always standard and they're always there in every generation, they don't change. Okay, that's what we'll be focusing on today. And by the grace of God, we'll be concluding next week in part five by looking at how to manage the money that we have already made 
appropriately and how to also send our money that we have already made on errand to multiply itself, to get more money and bring more money back home. Those were the outlines for last week. And then we looked at money as a game last week. That money is like a game. And like every game, money has its own rules. And money flows into the hands of those who understand the rules of money. Money runs away from those who don't understand the rules of money, who therefore run foul of those rules. It's like you are playing in a game and you commit a foul. You'll be sanctioned. You'll be penalized. You can win a penalty for your side. If in the soccer game, you use your hand to grab the ball because you don't understand the rule of soccer that you're not supposed to touch it with your hand except the goalkeeper. So if you don't understand the rule of money too, you do certain things and you lose money. You are penalized for running foul of the rule of money. So you need to acquaint yourself with the rules governing money. We looked at that last week in part three. We also mentioned that money is like a catalyst and an influencer. You can see somebody who appears very gentle and humble when he didn't have money. The moment money comes, that money catalyzes something inside that person. It influences the person and transforms the, the nature and the character and the behavior of that person. That person that you used to think was gentle and humble, now that money has come, suddenly becomes arrogant and unteachable. Okay, money can influence a person and the Bible says a lot about that. Okay, and then money, the Bible says money answers. The scripture says money answers all things. I've explained that. Uh, I explained that in total in, in, total in part three, money answers all things. But the portion that we're looking at is money answers. And if money answers, it means that there is, the, there is a way to call money and money will answer you. And there's a way you call money that money will not answer you. I mean, if I'm seated uh, among several people and somebody comes and begins to call, call Johnson, Johnson, Mr. Johnson, I'm not likely to look in that direction because I am not Johnson, <laughs> I will not answer. But if somebody says, hey, Tony, Tony, in fact, you say it once, I will look in your direction because now you are calling my name and that makes me to respond. If you call money properly, if you know how to call money, how to attract money, money will come because money answers, okay? We also mentioned the fact that it's easy to spend money if you keep it within easy reach. One of the keys for managing money and saving money and not wasting money is to make sure as much as possible, you don't keep the money you have within easy reach. Make it difficult for yourself to spend impulsively. That's one of the secrets of retaining money in your hands. And then we say money has its own limitations. Even though money is good, money is wonderful, money can do many beautiful things, but money does not answer all things as Solomon claimed. We explained that theologically very clearly last week. Money, money definitely does not answer all things. It has limitations. And we saw in Genesis where the Bible says money failed in Egypt. The Bible says in the book of Psalms that money cannot pay for the redemption of a soul. Jesus Christ himself says, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and suffers the loss of his soul? So money has its limitations. Money cannot save a man from dying. A trillionaire will still die when the time comes to die. If money were to be able to answer for death, then there are some people who would not have died by now, they will still be alive. But their money notwithstanding, they still died. So money has its own limitations. Money cannot buy you salvation. Money cannot buy you eternity in heaven, okay? Money is a good servant, but money is a very bad master. So make money your servant, it will serve you well. But if you make money your master, it will ruin your life. We also said that money can deceive. The Bible talks about the deceitfulness of riches. Money can deceive people and give them false hope and false security, false confidence. Money can even choke the word of God in a person's heart and make the person no longer open to the word or dependent upon the word, but now put their hope and their trust in money. And the Bible says, cursed is any man who puts his trust in man or in things. For the life of a man does not consist in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Things cannot be your source of confidence or hope. And the parable of the sower that Jesus told us, we saw that the seed 
fell upon several grounds. The one that fell among thorns. When Jesus interpreted that, he said, when the word of God, which is the seed, falls among thorns, he said, the deceitfulness of riches now chokes the word of God. It chokes it to death. It makes it of none effect. That's what money can do if you allow it. That's why we say money is a very bad master. And we said money endures only when built on the foundation of righteousness. Proverbs 8.18 says, durable riches come with righteousness. When righteousness is out of place, the money that comes develops wings and flies away. Durable riches comes with righteousness. So that's the summary of part three. Now we go to today's presentation, which is part four. I want to also emphasize something I mentioned last week about OPM and OPT. I use some of these uh, terms that I use in business management, uh, as well as those that I have coined by myself, so as to help us remember and recollect some of the thoughts that we have shared. I mentioned ICI earlier in part two, if you remember, that people who become broke and who lack money are suffering from the ICI syndrome. In other words, they, they don't have ideas. They don't have money-making ideas. I stands for ideas. When you lack money-making ideas, you are going to be living from hand to mouth. And number two is competence. When you lack competence, you don't have skills, you don't have knowledge, you don't have expertise. There's nothing that you are good at. There's nothing you know to do that can earn you money. That's you lack the competencies, you lack the skills that can make you also a poor man and make you broke. And number three, integrity. If you lack integrity, no matter how skillful you are, no matter how smart in other areas you are, if you lack integrity, even if you make money to be for a short time, before you know it, your lack of integrity will catch up with you and it will be your albatross. So you have to have money-making ideas. You have to be competent in doing something, skillful at doing something, have expertise in something, and you must maintain integrity in your business dealings. That is the ICI syndrome. Lack of ideas, lack of competence, lack of integrity. It is a recipe for poverty and being broke. Now today we are talking about OPM. If you remember OPM that I mentioned last week, other people's money. Those who understand money know how to use other people's money to generate income. But in using other people's money, we delineated that there are two types. You can use other people's money, which is legitimate and which is biblical. And you can use other people's money, which is unscriptural and which is wickedness. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 16, he who oppresses the poor to increase his own riches. He said that person will surely come to poverty. I mean, that's the Bible. And anything that is in the Bible for me, it is the final word. Anyone that oppresses the poor to increase his own riches. So in an attempt to use other people's money to increase your own wealth, you are not paying your staff salary. People supply you, you are not paying them for their product that they have supplied. People render services to you, consultancy services or whatever services they have rendered to you. You refuse to pay them and you are diverting the money to expand your own business while they are hungry. Their family is hungry. That is a curse. That is wickedness. That is not the biblical concept of using other people's money. But the biblical concept of using other people's money, we have explained that also last week. You can take a loan a credit facility from the bank or from anywhere. You can get somebody who gives you a grant, maybe a soft loan, a family member, a relative, you know, who says, take this and use it and then return it to me in six months time or in one year's time. Or you have something you produce and some people come to make deposits in advance for your product, even when you have not produced it because they want to secure their supply. And they say, hey, I'm giving you 10 million naira, please. When you produce, prioritize me because I've already paid in advance for the products. And then you use their deposits to produce and supply to them. That is using other people's money legitimately. There is nothing wrong with that. So that is the clarification on that. Today, we are going to the second part of the four components of financial intelligence. Don't forget again, part one is understanding money. Part two is understanding how to make money, making money. And I'm going to begin with an experience I had 34 years ago. And that was precisely in the year 1987. I just graduated from university in June 1987. I went on youth service. We went to the orientation camp uh, 
I think that was in late August, early September, 1987. Uh, I was posted to Lagos State, Nigeria to serve. And coppers in Lagos, uh, for those who are not in Nigeria or Nigerians who do not understand youth service, in Nigeria, when you graduate from college, from university, from a tertiary institution, you're supposed to serve the nation for 12 months, for one year. It's compulsory, it's mandatory, it's by law. And during that one year, you are posted to any state within the country, and there you serve. So when you are posted to a state, all the people posted to the same state, are they are camped in an orientation camp. You have like a boot camp from where you spend four to six weeks, as the case may be. Now they spend four weeks. In our own time, we spent six weeks, OK? We did four weeks of paramilitary training and then two weeks of entrepreneurial training. During our time, they introduced the additional period of entrepreneurial training. Now, while I was in the orientation camp, uh, several students from all the states of the Federation were there. And I was having my meditation one morning and reading the Bible. There, God spoke to me clearly from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 10 to 15. That is precisely what I'm sharing here with you. It says, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence, it was parted and became into four heads. The river that watered the Garden of Eden divided into four river heads. And each of them fulfilled a purpose or was targeted at a particular portion of the garden. He said in verse 11, the name of the first is Python. That is it which compassed the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. That was where I got the name Havila from. All my business enterprises have been named Havila. When I started an ICT company, that's uh, information Commun and communication technology company. I'm a computer engineer by training. That was the first degree I earned at the University of Ife. And so I set up, when I resigned my employment as chief engineer of a company, I set up my own computer consultancy firm, which I named Havila Ventures Limited. It was based on that encounter I had with the word of God in the orientation camp as a copper. And even today, I am a nutritional consultant and I have a health store. And that health store is also named Havila Health Haven. So that name Havila, I picked it from the Bible, 1987. It says the first river was called uh, the river Pison and that river compassed the whole land of Havila. And the land of Havila, it says that is the land where there is gold. So I called Havila Treasure Island. That's the, the island where there is gold because the river Python surrounded that piece of land. And I still remember in my primary school, they taught us what is an island. An island is a piece of land surrounded by water. So when I saw that, oh, river Python compassed the land of Havila, I called it Havila Island. And the Bible says on that island, there is gold. And mind you, when that river compassed that land, I asked myself, but why would the river spot that land, the land of Havila, and surround it? Was it attempting to kind of demarcate that portion and also make it difficult for people to access the land? Because before you can access the gold in Havila, you must find a way to cross the river that has surrounded that land. In other words, when you find an island, a treasure island, typically there will be obstacles. There will be things that will want to prevent you from accessing it. So your strategy is to overcome that obstacle. Your strategy is to overcome that river and cross it so that you can access your island. And that is where God must give you the wisdom and give you the grace and give you the strategy to be able to overcome. Now, for you to cross to Havila Island, you must cross River Python. Maybe you have to build a boat to be able to do row, row, row your boat gently down this and cross to the other side. Or maybe you have to get a speedboat, or you have to buy a ship if it's a big one, or a big river, or you have to build a bridge, or you have to find an helicopter. I mean, you have to find a way to overcome that river Python to get to your island. But that's not our focus today, really. The focus I'm trying to give today is I will land there when the time comes. Now, verse 12 says, and the gold of that land is good. And it's not only gold that is there, there's also delium. And onyx stone is also there on Havila Island. Verse 13 says, and the name of the second river is Gison. The same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And number 14, verse 14 says, and the name of the third river is Hidekel. 
And that is it which goes toward the east of Assyria and the fourth river is Euphrates. So you can see four rivers here, River Pison, River Gihon, River Hidekel, and River Euphrates. One river was coming to water the Garden of Eden, but just before it got to the garden, it divided into four. So effectively and technically speaking, four rivers were watering or feeding the land of Eden, the Garden of Eden. And when I was doing my meditation in 1987, 34 years ago, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, your destiny, your life must be watered by at least four streams of incomes. So I wrote in my book that I wrote in the year 1999, the title of the book is Stand Up. I published that book 22 years ago. So I titled the book Stand Up. And in one of the chapters, I discussed these multiple streams of income, that if you want your life to be guaranteed and to be insured, and you never want to go broke or become financially uh, insufficient at any point in time for the rest of your life, you have to systematically start creating multiple streams of income into your life. I got that principle and that concept in 1987 at the orientation camp 34 years ago. And I published it in my book, Stand Up, 22 years ago. That was 12 years after I got that revelation. And I want to share it with you again today that if you check your life and your money-making machine, when I say money-making machine, I'm not talking about a physical machine. I'm talking about your sources of income now. If your sources of income or you have only one source of income, then you need to start working towards creating an additional source of income and then an additional source of income and then an additional source of income. Of course, you can't start four at the same time. You have to do it systematically, step by step, one after the other. So in your attempts to make money, number one, you have to make money legitimately. Number two, you have to play safe so that you are not scammed. And number three, you have to create multiple streams of income. So I sat down in 1987 at the orientation camp. I opened the file and I told myself, what will be my four streams of income? And I tabulated them. Up to today, I keep reviewing them from time to time. And at any given point in time, I have multiple streams of income, okay? I am an author of books. I get royalty from my books. I am a public speaker. I get honoraria. I am... Uh, uh, a trainer, I, I do healthy living training, I earn income from there, and, and many other sources of income. So you two must sit down and look at your life. In fact, I got to a point in my life when I could say to the church that I pastor, don't pay me any salary. I don't need any salary anymore. By the grace of God, God is supplying for my needs. And I have been living and pastoring and putting in all in pastoring my church, the church that God has placed me over without earning a salary from that because I have created multiple streams of income that is watering my garden. And the wisdom in that is that if you have only one stream of income, if that stream dries up, you are in a cross soup, you are in serious trouble. You need to create multiple streams a minimum of four, because God gave us that model, ab initio, right from the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, the very first book of the Bible, with the very first couple, the very first family. Every family must sit down. After this teaching, I expect you and your spouse to sit down and say, hey, how many sources of income do we have in this family? Let's assume that the husband has a source of income, the wife has a source of income, that's two. But what else? You must create additional two to water the garden of your family. That's how to safeguard yourself and secure yourself with the wisdom of God and with the model that God has given to humanity right from the beginning of creation. Okay, so that's what we mean when we're talking about making money. You have to find means of making money and making it legitimately. Now, when you are planning, uh, when, when, when I ask this question, you know, when you are in employment, don't forget I said last week that, um, um, you know, was it last week or part two? I can't remember now whether part two or part three. I did say then that if you are an employee, you must understand that there is no employer that sets up a business for the purpose of making billionaires out of employees. There's no such business on the face of the earth. You can't find one. That our vision and our mission as a corporate 
entity, as a business enterprise, is to make billionaires out of our employees. No business that I'm aware of has that as their mission statement. Every business has a mission statement that has a few components. One component is okay, we want to be the best in our industry. We want to be the leaders in our industry. That's typically what you find. Number two, they, say, they will say, we want to give good returns to our investments. I mean, our investors we want to give good returns to our investors. That's the second component you will typically find in the mission statement of any company. Number three, they will say, we want to make our customers happy. That's the third thing you will find. Number four, if it is there at all, it will be, we want to create a safe and conducive working environment for our staff. And that's all. You won't find that says our aim and our mission and goal is to make billionaires out of our staff, which means that when you start out in life as an employee, you must not stay there until you can no longer work and retire after you are 60, 65, 70, 80. That is not the right trajectory. That's not the right track to follow. Of course, all of us may have to start, or may, let me say most of us may have to start as employees. Because when you are just out of school and a starter, you don't have what it takes maybe to set up yet to be a, to, to, to go into a startup business. You may not have what it takes. You may not have the expertise yet, the experience. You may not have all the understanding of enter, enterprises and businesses. You may not have the capital. You may not have an understanding of the market, an understanding of the business. So you may not have what it takes because you're a greenhorn. No problem. You can start out start out as an employee. And then you give yourself a target, a goal. Okay, I will work as an employee for 10 years or for 15 years or for 20 years. And then after that, I'm going to transition into becoming an employer. That is how it should be. So now, uh, when, when you start out as an employee, you have that at the back of your mind. But if you don't, and you think you are going to work for 35 years and retire, and then begin to expect pension, that to me, is the basic, basic minimum that you can do in life. It is not ambitious, probably laid back in my view. And that can also boomerang at the end of the day because nobody will guarantee you, first of all, 35 years of employment. The world keeps changing from time to time to time to time. So you are the mercy of trends that develop along the way. So you must have a long-term plan for yourself. And the question I ask you is, are you spending your time and skills simply to earn an income, to pay your bills, or to build a legacy? Which one? If you are just earning an income, you are an accountant, you are an insurance person, you are um, a business manager, you are an HR manager, you are this or you are that, whatever you are, all you are doing is eight to five, eight to five, to earn a salary for 30 years, for 35 years, then you are the one making OPT possible. Other people's time, which I shared last week. You give the real entrepreneurs and the real money makers and the real business, uh, uh, business people and billionaires opportunities to have somebody else's time and talent to hire and pay for. You are the one making OPT possible. So after 35 years of earning salaries, what happens to you? Because salaries never build wealth. You won't find a salary earner that is a billionaire. You won't find one. It's a salary earner and it's a billionaire and he's doing nothing else apart from salary. You can't find one. If you find a salary earner that is a billionaire, he has other streams of income by the side, different from the salary, the one he's earning salary from. And by the way, as a Christian, as a child of God, if you are working for somebody and you are earning the salary and you are also building uh, a business by the side, please don't use the time of your employer to run your own private business. That is not going to be fair. That will not be fair. As a believer, you should never be caught doing that. If you are being paid for eight to five, make sure you put in the eight to five conscientiously. And then your own spare time is what you use in investing into building your own brand, your own business. Now, I was invited in April 2016 to come and deliver a series of lectures to uh, would be retirees, you know, civil servants that were about to retire, those who had between one and six months left to retire. Either they have put in 35 years into service or they were going to clock 60 years of age 
So it was called pre-retirement training. And in April 2016, the Lagos State government in Nigeria actually enlisted me among the facilitators to come and train these uh, would-be retirees. And so when I took the microphone for my own two sessions that I presented, I, I told all the participants, hundreds of them, I told them, I said that this lecture that they have invited me to come and give, they, it was coming 10 years too late. That they should have invited me 10 years before these people clocked 60 to come and train them like this. So it would have been better if I came when they were 50 than when they are now 60. And they were looking at me. They asked you to come and train us to prepare us for retirement. You are telling us that the lecture is 10 years too late. I said, yeah, that's the truth. You should have undertaken this training 10 years ago when you were 50, not now. And my reason is because at 60, you're already approaching that age where you are tired. You don't have that fire and that zeal in you anymore, except with few exceptions. You should have been building your own enterprise 10 years before retirement or five years before retirement so that you can retire into it and transition into it. You see, uh, uh, if they had undertaken that training 10 years ago, one of the things I will have, I will have, that, that will have triggered will be some of them when their eyes are opened to entrepreneurship and to opportunities of setting up their own businesses and enterprises and they see the kind of money that they can make they can make four times to 10 times or more of their salaries in a month, okay? Some of them will opt for early retirement. At the age of 50, they will opt for early retirement from that employment. And you know what that will do? That will create room for new entrants. All these young people, youths, young university graduates that don't have jobs, by the time 100 top civil servants retire, it will make room for new entrants to come in. And it will also give room for promotion because if everybody on level 16 suddenly retires, early retirement, then those who are on level 15 can be moved to level 16. Those who are on level 14, we go to level 15. Those who are on level 13, we go to, I mean, and everybody will be happy. There is a way it will ginger some enthusiasm and some, some you know, it will make the, the workers happy because now there's room for promotion. It's not that one person will sit on the same level for 10 years and they say, because there's no vacancy above you, you cannot be promoted. So you see, those who go on early retirement make room for people to be promoted. And as they are promoted at the bottom, there will not be space for new recruits to come in. And so it will open up the, the system for, for new employees to join the civil service. It will absorb new entrants from the labor market and that will reduce the crime rate because you see, those who are already 50, who have put in, let's say, 20 or 25 years of service in the system, who have built up a little capital, and then the system also gives them some incentives, incentives for early retirement. To say, okay, if you opt to retire at 50, instead of waiting till 60, we are going, we are going to give you 30 million naira, or 40 million naira, or 50 million naira to set up a business. I mean, many, many top civil servants, senior civil servants will opt for that. Okay, give me the 30 million, I'm happy with that. Let me go and set up my business. And you see, that incentive will make them opt for that. And if you take these 50 year olds and you give them, let's say 30, 30 million naira each or even 20 million, even 10 million naira each to go and set up their businesses. Number one is that these people have already reached that level where they are supposed to be mature. They are more experienced, they are more cautious. And then they are also more connected. If they leave the system and they set up a business, they can always get contracts from the same system because now they have so many people they know within the system, unlike a youth couple or a fresh graduate coming out of school who doesn't know anybody anywhere. And then a 50 year old, even if at the end of the day, that business doesn't succeed and he has to rely only on his pension, he's not likely going to carry a gun and become an arm robber or become a kidnapper. He's too old for that. But if you leave these young people in their twenties and thirties without a job, without hope, those are the ones that become the miscreants. They become the arm robbers, they become the criminals that commit violent crimes all over the place. So when you give incentives for early retirement, you create experienced and well-connected entrepreneurs. And then those people who retire early with the incentive given to them and the training given to them are going to create jobs you find that each of them may be able to employ five young people 
and start growing them and developing them and mentoring them and maturing them. And the system keeps revolving like that. So we create more employment. People are happier on the job because promotion is now rapid. And then there is incentive for those who want to become employers and those employers create more jobs and everything is rolling. Unlike a situation where people turn 60 and uh, they are falsifying their birth certificates so that they are 55, so they can spend additional five years and they stay put, they don't want to go. And so there is no room for new people to come. And somebody graduated from university at the age of 21 and is roaming the streets until he's 25, there's no job. You are making a criminal out of him. So you see, that is very, very, that's a system that we need to work at as a nation to help create a conducive atmosphere for everybody to grow, everybody to have an opportunity, everybody to get a chance, and everybody to make progress, to reduce unemployment, to reduce crime at the end of the day. And then you must understand also as a person that if you work for 35 years, earning salary eight to five, by the time you retire, your children cannot inherit your certificate. Neither can your children inherit your job position. You can retire as a permanent secretary. You can retire as a minister of this or minister of that. You can retire as a director. <laughs> your child is not going to take your job position when you retire. It's going to go to another person. Your children can only inherit your estate, your investments, and your businesses. And that's why you should not live your life for 30 years, 35 years, 40 years, only working 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. You need to create an, an enterprise. You need to create something that you can bequeath as a legacy on your posterity. Very, very important. Now let's look at the pros and cons of a university degree vis-a-vis -vis financial intelligence, okay? Now, I am not in any way discounting university education or tertiary education. I mean, I have three tertiary, edu uh, tertiary uh, degrees or certificates. I earned a degree in computer engineering, 1987. I earned another degree in theology. I earned another one in nutritional consulting. So I know the value of education, particularly tertiary education. But whereas a university degree is desirable, yet if care is not taken, it could jolly well become the bane or the albatross of an average graduate. Why? I'll give you four or five reasons. One, because a typical Nigerian graduate, now this may not be applicable to graduates in every country, but I'm using the Nigerian case now as a case study. A typical Nigerian university graduate is not equipped to start his or her own business or enterprise to be able to generate 100,000 naira or more profit for himself or herself monthly. He's not equipped for that. Very few universities in Nigeria equip their graduates to be able to set up after graduation without working for anybody. Very few universities do that, a few private universities. But most of the universities in Nigeria don't prepare their graduates for that. So you find a typical Nigerian university graduate is happy to work for someone else to earn half of the amount that he could have generated for himself had he started an enterprise. So he's ready to take 30,000 a month, 40,000 a month, 50,000 a month, and he's going with a very long CV and photocopies of certificates and he's begging to apply. A university degree can turn a person into an applicant for years without undertaking anything, without venturing into anything, without taking a chance or taking a risk. Because number two, an average Nigerian university degree holder does not know how to start a business enterprise and grow it in three years to become an employer of labor. But he or she is prepared to roam the street for three years in search of an elusive job. And then when he doesn't get the job, he blames everybody else except himself or herself for not getting the job. He blames the government. He blames business owners who refuse to employ him. He blames even God for his or her misfortune in quotes. Because he didn't get a job, he considers that a misfortune. And he's very touchy, irritable, and angry with everybody. He blames the devil. He blames God for not having a job. OK? And that is the irony of a university degree in this climate. Now, number three, give 100,000 Naira to an average Nigerian degree holder, and then give 
another 100,000 naira to a stack illiterate and tell them to do something with it and watch the degree holder squander his own 100,000 naira buying expensive phones and then eating chicken and chips. Whereas the stack illiterate, who is not university educated, you will find that he will use his or her own 100,000 naira to start selling phone accessories or to start frying and selling chicken and chips by the roadside or bread and akara. And in one year's time, the stack illiterate is likely going to employ the degree holder as his or her accountant. When I used to live in the part of Lagos called the Luwura inside, I mean, when the first or the second house I rented, the house I, I wedded into, it was a four bedroom apartment in Uluwura inside in Lagos. When I used to live in that house, I lived there for 12 years, okay? In Uluwura inside in the 1990s. I started living there from 1991 till about 2000 and 2003, okay, 12 years. Now, I found out to my utter charge it was a discovery that rocked me to my bottom. I found out that most of the tenants on my street or MAG street, including my wife and I, most of the tenants living on that street, we were all tie and suit wearing university graduates. Some of us with master's degree with MBAs, chartered accountants and chartered this and chartered that. We had university lecturers, we had engineers, we had the uh, marketers, we had pharmacists and all kinds of different people living on that street. All of us who were tenants were university graduates. And you know something else I found out? 100% of the landlords and landladies that owned the houses on that street were all of them without exception, stack illiterates. All of them. They were auto mechanics, they were bricklayers, they were petty traders and panel beaters and auto rewires and all kinds of, you know, artisans. They built the houses that we graduates and chatter this chatter that were renting. That got me thinking that could university degree become a curse if it is not properly utilized? And that's one thing, that's food for thought. You need to think about it. Ask yourself, you've graduated from university for 10 years now. What have you been able to do for yourself? Could your certificate be your albatross? Could your certificate be the stumbling block? Could your university degree be the hindrance that has not allowed you to be able to become a landlord up to today? Ask yourself a question. I know I'm stepping on some very delicate toes right there, but I'm doing that intentionally because I want to get you thinking. I want to get you angry. I want to get you to wake up. Number four, a, a Nigerian university degree holder prefers to sweep the street in London to end the currency with a surname. You know, there's only one currency in the world that has a surname. It's called the pounds sterling. All other currencies have a first name, but this particular one has a surname. An average Nigerian degree holder prefers to sweep the street in London to end the currency with his son in the pound sterling than to dirty his hands in Nigeria to build an enterprise from the ground up. And number five, sometimes to become financially viable, to be able to make money, you might need to hide your university certificate and simply use your triple H. I'm using another acronym here so that you will remember. Don't forget the ICI syndrome. Okay, I'm sure you remember that. The ICI syndrome, don't forget it. Now I'm mentioning the Triple H. What do I mean by Triple H? You need to sometimes hide your certificate and use your Triple H to create a platform for your financial success. And the first H stands for your heart. The second H, your head. And the third H, your hands. Use your heart, use your head, use your hands. Put your certificate aside for now. You are talking about making money. Because financial intelligence means you understand money. And number two, you understand how to make money. How to make money. What do I mean by your heart? I mean your passion, your zeal, your enthusiasm, and your humility. Because if you're arrogant, there are some things you won't want to do. You say, it's beneath me. I'm too much for that. I'm too much for that. And there are those who are making money from there. And you are too, too arrogant and too, too, how do I put it now? You are too proud. That you cannot do such jobs because you think you're too much because you're a university graduate. So your heart is important. Apply your heart. Become passionate. Become zealous. 
become enthusiastic and be humble. It's all a matter of the heart. And somebody says the heart of the matter is the heart. The heart of the matter is the heart. And then use your head, your intelligence, your knowledge, your wisdom, apply everything. All the things you have learned, deploy them. Don't warehouse them. And then use your hands, deploy your hands, your skills, your readiness to work, be industrious, be diligent, work hard and work smart. That's how to make money. We're talking about understanding how to make money. And then the question arises, okay? I have a business idea. I want to start an enterprise. Should I borrow money? Should I not borrow money? Some people will say the Bible says thou shalt not borrow. Now, there are many scriptures and the Bible says we compare scripture with scripture. We compare scripture with scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 6, and Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 12. Both of them say, thou shalt lend unto many nations and thou shalt not borrow. So some people have taken that out of context to say that a believer should never borrow. I'm going to clarify. There's a time to borrow. There's a time not to borrow. In Proverbs 22, verse 7, in the Living Bible, it says, just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. So because of that, he said, don't borrow. Romans 13, 8 says, owe no man anything but to love one another. The only thing you should owe other people is love. Don't owe them money. Okay? That's one side of the coin. A coin has two sides, the head and the tail. You cannot just go to the market with a coin that doesn't have the other side. The other side is wiped out. You're not likely going to accept it as a legal tender. Both sides must be intact. That is one side. Don't be a borrower. And then there's another side where the Bible says, go and borrow. And in fact, it says, borrow not a few. Borrow plenty, plenty. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 3. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 42, the Bible says, we should lend to him that wants to borrow from us. If you lend to somebody, that means somebody is borrowing. So the question is, when should we borrow? When should we not borrow? First of all, let's lay some foundation. Let's look at the Passion Translation of the Bible, Psalm 37, verse 21. It says, they break their promises, borrowing money but never paying it back. The good man returns what he owes with some extra besides. The good man returns what he owes with some extra besides. So when you want to borrow, the first question you ask is, this money I'm borrowing, am I going to be able to pay it back? If what you're going to apply it to is not going to generate additional income to enable you to pay back, then don't borrow. In other words, don't borrow to eat. Don't borrow to buy clothes. Don't borrow to throw a party. Don't borrow to do a naming ceremony. Don't borrow money to go and buy a car. Don't borrow money to buy, uh, what's now, a phone. Don't borrow on consumables. If you are borrowing, make sure you are able to pay back because the righteous who borrow money, they pay back. Said the good man returns what he owes with some extra besides. That extra means even if there's an interest to pay on top of it, you are able to pay that interest as well. And you also have some extra left for yourself. If you can guarantee that this money you are borrowing, you'll be able to pay back the capital, pay the interest, and also have some profit left for you, then go ahead and borrow. If that cannot be guaranteed, that is not the time to borrow. Some people borrow money to conduct wedding. What stupidity. Why must you borrow to do wedding? Look at the contemporary English version of Psalm 37 verse 21. It says, an evil person borrows and never pays back. A good person is generous and never stops giving. Then the English Standard Version says, the wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. New International Reader's Version says, sinful people borrow and don't pay back, but those who are godly give freely to others. Now, look at the thing that is happening here. It means that if you borrow and you don't pay back, the Bible calls you an evil person, okay? That's what the Bible calls you, an evil person. you find that in Psalm 37, verse 1, contemporary English version. The Bible calls you a wicked person in the English Standard Version. The Bible calls you a sinful person in the New International Reader's Version of the Bible. 
So somebody who borrows money, who refuses to pay, is an evil person, is a wicked person, is a sinful person, and in the Passion Translation, is a promise breaker. You don't want to be that kind of a person. In fact, I hear of believers who borrow money, and rather than pay back their loans, they go to the mountain to pray for debt cancellation. In fact, I hear of some pastors conducting debt cancellation services so that people who have borrowed money, who are owing money, should come. And the pastor will use his anointing to pray for them so that all their debts will be canceled. You don't have intention to pay. You are praying that the debt should be canceled. The Bible calls you an evil person, a wicked person, a sinful person, and a promise breaker. That's who you are. I am not one of such pastors that holds debt cancellation services. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do not mean that God cannot make your debt to be canceled. God can do that. But it shouldn't come from you. You shouldn't be the one going to fast and pray that your creditor should just call you and say, okay, I have written off your debt. No. When you borrow, it should be with intention to pay back. That's what makes you a righteous person, a godly person. Okay? Very, very important. That's what makes you a good man. Because it says in the Passion Translation, the good man returns what he owes. And then in the contemporary English version, it says the righteous, a good person is generous. In the English standard version, it says the righteous is generous and pays back. And then in the new international readers version of the Bible, it says godly people, they pay back what they owe. So let's look at good debt versus bad debt. So what is a bad debt? A bad debt is one where the money borrowed is not paid back. It is money borrowed and used on consumables. You borrow money to pay your rent. That's a bad debt. You borrow money to buy food, to buy cars, to buy clothes, to wed, to conduct naming ceremony for your baby. Must you do a naming ceremony? Can't your pastor and a few elders come to your house and just name your baby and bless your baby? You don't even have to serve any food. Bad debt is money borrowed that others have to pay on your behalf. You can pay bad money or bad debt is the money you borrow that your creditor, after you have defaulted and defaulted and defaulted, he is angry and annoyed and he loses hope that you will ever pay and he writes it off, not, not with joy. He writes it off because he knows even if he doesn't write it off, you cannot pay. That is bad debt. No believer should become a bad debtor. No believer. Praying for your debt to be canceled is not a virtue. When you borrow, plan to pay your debt. That's authentic Christianity. And then what is a good debt? A good debt is money borrowed that you are able to pay back. A good debt is money borrowed and leveraged to generate more money. You take a loan from the bank to expand your business, and then you pay back the loan to the bank and you make profit. Or to execute a project, and then you make profit. That's a good debt. Money borrowed to spend I mean, not to spend or waste, that is good debt. Now, let me tell you something about debts, the nature of debts, basically. Number one, debt is the monster that takes the joy out of payday. You know, some people, they buy book me down, book me down. They go to work, they go to the canteen, they buy food, they don't pay, this. they have a ledger where the caterer will enter their name and all the food they are eating from from the first day of the month to the last day of the month. And so by the time they pay their salary on the last day of the month, 50% of that salary is already going to pay for the debt that they have owed. That is what a debt does. It is the monster that takes the joy out of your payday. Then the nature of debt is that debts grow when not paid. Compound interest, it keeps getting worse, getting bigger and bigger. When you borrow to consume and you're unable to pay, you make your children into slaves. Find out in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. I read it in the New Living Translation. It says, one day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, my husband who served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord. That prophet that died was a God-fearing man. He said, but now a creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves because the man couldn't pay his debt before he died. So when you... Oh, bad debt. You even implicate your children. Being a prophet and being God-fearing are not enough to make you financially prosperous if you lack understanding of money and understanding of how to make money. Bad debt makes even you subservient and a slave to the lender. Debt takes away your human dignity. 
it brings you to shame and ignominy. Never lend someone the money you are not ready to let go, because that can create a criminy between you and that person. Do not serve as a guarantor for a debt that you are not able or willing to pay in the event of a default. These are the things about debt that we need to understand. The Bible gives us that wisdom. Genesis 43, 9, Proverbs 11, 15, Proverbs 17, 18, Proverbs 20, 16. You can read it in your own time because my time is almost up. So in order to make money, as we are talking about making money today, the first thing is that you must have a product or products that you are selling if you must make money. And your products could be tangible products or intangible products. Tangible products include like physical products that people can see with their eyes. You are selling food, you are selling clothing or furniture or whatever physical products. You are selling phones, you are selling you know, raw materials, whatever that people can see. Or you are selling intangible products such as your skills, your services, your time, or you are doing consultancy, or you are an entertainer, or you are setting, selling digital books, e-books, and what have you. But there must be a product. There must be something on offer that people are willing to pay money for. That's how to make money. If you don't have anything tangible or intangible that people are willing to offer money for in exchange, then you cannot make money. So the question is, what product or products are you offering for sale to make money? Ask yourself, what are my products? If you don't have any products that can people are willing to pay money to get, whether services or tangible products, then you are not in the money-making business. And please, in offering products for sale, do not offer your body for money or for max if you're a student. That's not the kind of product you should be selling for money, not your body, in prostitution. And don't sell your birthright. You will need it someday. And you may want it with tears like Esau, and you may not get it again. Don't sell your birthright. Neither should you sell your future for immediate gratification. Learn deferred gratification. Then to make money, you must also possess marketing skills. You must know how to market your product. That is very key. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 15, the labor of fools wearies them, for they do not even know how to go to the city. That's see the one on the line there. They do not know how to go to the city. Now, I will illustrate with this. I was in uh, Ibarakwa local government a couple of years ago. Irua, Ibora, Lanlate, you know, those axes. I, I went to minister in those axes in those days. And I found so many cashew plantations in that axis. Similarly, when I was a student uh, in primary and high school in Ondo State, there were many villages with mango trees in the bush. And these mangoes will produce plenty during the producing season. And all the mangoes will drop under the mango trees and rot. And the farmers and the villagers were not making money out of these things. The same thing with the cashews in the Barakwa local government, Ibora, Lalate, Rua. A lot of cashew trees there. And you will see the cashew fruits will drop. And everything will rot away. You see flies and bugs and insects having a field day, birds having a field day. Nobody is harnessing these things and taking them to the city to make money. That's what the Bible is referring to here. It said the labor of fools with them, for they do not even know how to go to the city. And yet, when I visited this place in uh, Oyo State, in the Rua Axis, I saw some, some people from other parts of the country in the far north you know, came with baskets in their hands, coming to buy these cashew nuts from the locals and paying them peanuts, peanuts, because the people there do not know how to go to the city. They don't know how to market what their land is yielding. And so they get peanuts paid to the local farmers, and then the people who buy it off them, take it to the city and make a huge amount of money. When I was in high school, my parents were in the village, they were cocoa farmers. And you see these cocoa merchants will come to the villages and come and buy the cocoa beans from these farmers and pay them peanuts. These farmers will work all year round, 10 months in the year. They are tending their cocoa, they are tending the plants, they are harvesting, they are drying the cocoa, they are doing everything. After 10 months, they have bags and bags and bags of cocoa beans. And then the cocoa merchants will come from the city, pay them peanuts and carry everything away. And they would be the one to process it and ship it abroad to chocolate factories and make huge sums of money. Because those who are producing it, they do not know how to go to the city. 
So whatever you have, whatever you have to sell, whether it is your skill or a tangible product, it is not enough to be a creator or an inventor of a product or the owner of an idea or the possessor of a skill. You must also know how to take your product to the market and make optimum profit from it. Very important. So when you finally start your own enterprise to make money, I have some simple business management tips for you. Number one is that you must understand basic record keeping and bookkeeping. Many entrepreneurs who run their businesses are ground because they don't understand this. Number two, separate business fund from personal funds. Don't mingle your personal fund with your business fund and just be spending anyhow. Number three, fix a salary for yourself. So at the end of the month, you know that from this enterprise, this is how much I'm paying myself. Number four, don't start paying yourself what you are worth but what the business can afford for now. Okay, you just set up a business last month. The total turnover of your business is 100,000 Naira. Your profit out of that is 30,000 Naira. And then you are telling yourself, I'm a graduate. I will pay myself 50,000. You will ruin that business. Don't pay what you are worth. Pay what the business can afford. If you made a profit of 30,000, pay yourself 15,000 or maximum 20,000 and plow back 10,000 to the original 70 and make it 80. Next month, your profit will be bigger. And as the business grows, you can increase your salary. Number five, pay for every product you take for personal use, except there are some complementary products or copies that you can take and enjoy as the owner of the business. As much as possible, avoid selling on credit because people who buy on credit will ruin your businesses, particularly your friends and relatives. Because you can't arrest them with the police <laughs> if they, de they default. So the best thing is to avoid that crisis. Then ensure appropriate pricing of your products. Don't overprice and don't underprice. I tell people if you buy this mouse for 10 naira and you sell it for 15 naira, you have not made 5 naira profit. No. Because there are other costs that you have to take into account. You paid rent for the shop, you paid your staff, you paid utility bills, you paid insurance and so on and so forth. All of that has to be taken into account. So your profit is not five naira. In fact, selling at 15 naira, you might be making a loss by the time you take all those other extra costs into account. You have to know everything that goes into a product to determine your landing cost so that you appropriately price it to take care of every cost and then leave you a margin. And if you have a margin of less than 20%, 25%, you are not doing too good. Then identify products that move very fast and make those products your flagship products if you are selling products and never run out of stock for these flagship products that are in high demand. Then start from where you are and grow your business steadily. Then if you find somebody who is willing to give you a franchise, that person has already gained mileage. Consider taking that opportunity of franchising so you don't have to build from ground zero. You can stand on somebody else's shoulder. And as we round up, I want us to evaluate our money-making question. Today, the focus is understanding how to make money. Now, I want to assess yourself, evaluate yourself. What is my money-making question? The first question is, what is your theology of money? Some people tell me, ah, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. I say, no. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money itself. It is the love of money. 1 Timothy 6.10. So if your theology about money is warped, you need to straighten it up. Money itself is not bad, but the love of money is bad. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Second question, how many streams of income are watering your life? How many sources of income do you have? If you don't have multiple, this is the time to sit down and plan and generate multiple streams of income. Question number three, how can you create additional sources of income? Answer that question. That will create new sources or new streams. Number four, what are the dormant sources of income that you can activate or reactivate right away? Maybe there was something that was generating an income, you have shut it down and you can reactivate it now and increase your streams of income. Number five, can you collaborate with others to create mega wealth? Because Two are better than one. And number six, what is your ability or your capacity? Can you multitask? How many things can you do at a time? How many talents can you handle at a time? Remember the parable of the talents. 
Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents. That was the capacity of that person. To another he gave two. That was his own capacity. And to another he gave one. And look at what he says in the last statement. To every man according to his several ability. So the question is, what is your own several ability? What can you handle? You must stretch yourself to your optimum. Don't be laid back. Very, very important. Thank you very much. By the grace of God, we'll be concluding next week, Wednesday, on part five, where we'll be looking at managing money and multiplying money. And then we'll take some prayer points in the end. And also pray over every participant and release you to go forth and make money legitimately for your enjoyment and for the purposes that God intended. God bless you and thank you in Jesus' name.